Good evening. Welcome to tonight's show. With me is Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Mr. Lawrence Wong. Thank Good you for joining us. Joining us also are six fellow Singaporeans. They will take turns to sit across us, like you guys here at the table, two at a time. We're going to start off with Nicole Ng. You are co-founder of the Food Bank Singapore, a registered IPC. And Shamir Rahim, founder and group CEO of Versa Fleet. Yeah. Welcome, guys. Now, DPM, before I let them get cracking at you, mm -hmm. I'm going to take my chance to sure. ask you a question too. Because Fire budget, away. budget 2023 has been said to be very generous. You have said it was supposed to be a Valentine's Day present anyway. So uh, some commentary out there is saying perhaps it's too generous. Have we uh, tried to insulate Singaporeans from the realities out there in the world? Are we sort of uh, uh, spending money when perhaps we should be saving instead? Sure. Well, I'm, it's interesting that you say it's too generous. I'll be very curious to see what our other guests here today think of the budget because there are also many segments of society who constantly ask the government to do much more. So really, the budget is always a balancing exercise. And this, in this year's budget, it was particularly challenged to, challenging to find the right balance uh, because we do want to get back on track to a balanced budget position after having spent so much during the pandemic. But at the same time, we know that the economy is weak, there are downside risk, and people do need help with cost of living pressures. So we want to do something to spend to help them because if we were to taper down and reduce spending too much, then I think you will not be able to do enough to help Singaporeans. Uh, at the same time, if you spend too much uh, you have the concerns that, Steve, yep. you just raised. And also, you may inadvertently stimulate demand and cause inflation to be worse. Mm. So it really was a balancing act. And in the end, we focused our spending. A lot of the measures were focused on the lower income families, which I'm sure Singaporeans will appreciate need more help. Mm -hmm. and to make sure that they are able to cope with the increases in prices. Yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, that balance is often the biggest challenge, you know, mm -hmm. because if you give more here, you've got to take from somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. Well, challenges is the topic of our first round of conversation. And with the rise in GST since the start of the year, households and businesses have been feeling the pinch of increased costs. We met one family in that situation. Let's take a look. Singapore's GST rate rose to 8% this year and will rise to 9% in 2024. But additional support has been announced in Budget 2023 that will help cushion the impact of the higher GST rates and help Singaporeans with inflation. Yusri Abdul Hamid is one of those who have felt the pinch of rising costs. He is a father of eight, and a stay-at-home dad who also looks after his mother who has dementia. His youngest son, Ilham, has Down syndrome. My wife is, she's the sole breadwinner in the family. She's working as a security officer. She's uh, doing night shift, uh, 12-hour job. I'll be doing the uh, groceries on a uh, weekly basis. Now I have to really restrain myself from all that, more veggies instead, because uh, the price of chickens are not really risen to you know, such an extent where if I buy that chicken, I wouldn't be able to get other stuff or essential daily needs. For my mom, due to her illness, uh, she, can, uh, she needs to wear her diapers. Usually it was about you know, 10, 14 dollars. Now it's risen to $24 per packet, and it's only about seven piece. I believe that the government is doing whatever they can on their part and we, whatever us, each individual has their own part to play. I mean, we cannot just you know, depend on uh, help from the government. We've got to do something for ourselves. Personally, I've been living a hard life myself, so I'm just kind of used to it. I just need to you know, control myself. Don't just be too excessive in whatever. You need really to cut down on things. Wow. I mean, you three certainly has a lot mm. on this plate, you know, but at the same time, he realises mm -hmm. that he can't just rely on government yeah. for, for all his needs. Uh, GST vouchers, the assurance package, that was only help families no, like you and, three. And very commendable spirit. Yes, he definitely. Wants to do his attitude, part too. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Nicole, you are uh, familiar with households like you three, right? Yep. Do your work at the food bank. Yes, we uh, we actually serve um, 370 charity organisations, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and we reach out to about 300,000 uh, people indirectly through our partners as well. And, and what do you feel are the needs there? Um, 
Actually, I think up to a couple of years ago, uh, food was never seen as a basic necessity because in Singapore, we really have the luxury of easy access to mm. very affordable food, mm -hmm. right? But I think with COVID, mm -hmm. um, everybody has seen that, you know, inflation has also hit food as well. Um, so one of the things that um, we've also observed is because through my network um, that I work with, uh, we also work with social workers. Mm -hmm. And one of the feedbacks that we have received, and this is a question that I'd like to mm. pose today, yep. is that sometimes the grant application mm. and the means testing mm. is super complicated. Is this yeah. something that the government can address to simplify the means testing? Yeah, we have been doing that. Uh, Nicole, it's a very uh, uh, valid point. Mm. It's a feedback that arises from time to time, and that's why over the recent years, there's been an effort to streamline processes and to better coordinate and integrate some of them. Mm. It's largely now done through the Social Service Office or the SSO. Mm. Uh, so the SSO will be the one that coordinates at the back end. Across different government schemes, they will largely do the means testing mm. and they are conscious of the feedback and they are trying very hard to uh, streamline the processes as well. So it is happening already. Mm. I'm sure more can be done and I'm sure the officers at the SSO are doing their best. Yeah. Uh, there, there is ultimately still a need to do some means testing and still a need to make sure that we target the help to those who need it the most. Mm. The challenge is always to find mm. the most efficient way of doing it. Yeah. yeah. I, I think just to add as yeah. well, um, probably if at charities like ourselves, mm. if we are able to give feedback or help the social workers to, to give these help more easily as yeah. well, we'll be very happy to you know, yes, provide. Sure. And then to, yeah, because I see a lot of my social worker friends are also like being very stressed out. Mm. So I, I yeah. think, you know, collectively as a society, very we can much help so. each other. Very yeah. much so. I think we welcome that participation and, yeah. and the um, support from charities mm. because you play a very critical role on the ground. And the SSOs, uh, the officers at the SSO, they are not going to be able to do this by themselves. Yeah. They need to work very closely with social workers, with charities like yourselves, yeah. to be able to engage and provide for the families uh, effectively. Yeah, thank so, you. So in a way, it's better creating that link, that communication yeah. between all parties involved. So the people who really That's need right. help mm. get it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Shamia, you, you also volunteer and you've worked with non-profits. Uh, I mean, what are your concerns about the less privileged in our society? Mm, definitely. I think um, I particularly love the enhancements to uh, Kids Start. Mm. So I think, um, I mean, as a father of uh, young children as well, uh, you know, the cost of early childhood education can get pretty expensive, especially when offered by private operators. So I think uh, this is really important to enhance social mobility, keep that in our society. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing I do notice, though, um, there are some families who are unfortunately stuck in a vicious cycle. So they have uh, medical finance situations, large families, and as much as they might want to send their children to programs like Kids Start, literally sometimes the logistics doesn't allow it. Mm. You know? So what can we do you know, uh, as a community together to uh, you know, some measures that will help families in that situation? Well, Shamir, you have an excellent point because the, all, all the, a lot of the research shows that the child's early years are very critical in their potential in life. And therefore, we have to do everything we can to close the gap at that early stage. Kids Start is really meant before preschool even starts. Mm -hmm. right? So Kids Start, we're talking about infants. Um, and we are, we've announced in the budget that we're going to roll this out and we will cover 80% uh, of children nationwide. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, 100%, but we set for ourselves 80%, which is a real scaling up of Kids Start so that we literally put in resources to engage all uh, the families where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should be able to do that and, and get that scaled up nationwide. But then after the first year, second year of the child, you really want them to enrol mm -hmm. in childcare as early as possible. And there we, we see a little bit of a gap. At the kindergarten level, when they are five and six, um, the children in lower income families, particularly in rental flats, their enrollment is the same as the national average. Mm -hmm. So we've already been able to uh, in, you know, increase their enrollment and attendance. But at age three and four, it's still below. Yes. So we want them to get enrolled earlier. Mm. And part of the challenge is to make sure that there are enough uh, childcare centres nearby mm. because accessibility is an mm. issue. So we are also going to uh, put in place more childcare nice. places near where these families are located.
Perfect. But one of the challenges also is that, as you mentioned, sometimes these uh, children come from families of uh, lower wage earners. So to start off, they already are in a difficult situation. Uh, Nicole, maybe you although, can... Uh, although uh, affordability in childcare shouldn't be a problem because we've already reduced the fees to such a great extent that it costs as little as $3 a month. Right. So any kid who wants to go to school yeah. must be able to go to school. That's what you're saying. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, preschool. Preschool, I mean, okay. We, we school is not <laughs> a problem. Yeah, free. Kindergarten, as I said, is already getting better and better. Mm. So we're really going earlier. We're talking right. about now age three, four. Mm. As early as, you know, at that age. Yep. And then if they need childcare, and ideally, I think it's, uh, you know, then the parents can work yep. and then they can have their kids in a good environment mm -hmm. in full day childcare and we've made it affordable but we do need to have more places yeah. and we are working on that. So I think that's the challenge because even though the, the fees for the school, the accessibility is there, I mean some of them in their circumstances, I mean Nicole, I was coming to you because you mm. Uh, the family business exiting, you also have workers who are in the lower wage uh, bracket, you know, mm. and, and you feel that it's also about helping them earn more, right? Yeah, I think earning more is just one, but um, the sense of passion towards mm. their job, right? Mm -hmm. And now with tech, and when mm -hmm. we were all involving yeah. tech and everything else, I yeah. mean, <laughs> Shamir is in tech yes. himself. Um, with tech replacing a lot of the regular jobs yeah. already, I, I, I guess one question would be, how do you think the progressive wage can actually help these people yeah. to adapt or to want to improve themselves so that they continuously climb up the, the income ladder, as we say, and all of us progress you know, mm. upwards as well? The tech, tech, I don't think tech will remove jobs entirely. Yeah. Uh, because Singapore will always be a market where, and Shamir can attest to this and all the business <laughs> people later on can attest to this, where we are extremely labour tight. Yeah. We need workers. So the question is really more of, as the, the point you mentioned, Nicole, passion mm. and matching of the job to the individual's aptitude and fit and, and, and competencies and abilities. Mm. Uh, and if they find a good fit, hopefully they will feel engaged yeah. They will keep on learning and progressive wages will help tremendously because the whole idea of progressive wages mm. is to help them reskill, upskill along the career ladder and their wages keep on going up. To, to illustrate, we talked about lift technicians. Mm. It's an area that we do need more people to work in. Um, a few years ago, the starting salary for a lift technician was $1,300. Mm. I think it's too low. Mm -hmm. uh, with progressive wages, it's now 1800 And in time to come, we are aiming to get it to $2,000. Mm -hmm. But it's not simply a matter of saying, just raise the wages, because mm -hmm. we are training the lift technician with better skills mm -hmm. and making them more effective at their work. So that when the consumers, when, when residents pay more, because when wages go up, yeah. the cost of servicing the lift must go up. Yeah. But when you pay more, you feel assured that you are also getting better service and yeah. hopefully your list will break down less frequently. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, DPM, if I may add, because I serve a lot of hospitality yes. clients, yeah. I think um, it's that sense of pride in the job that they take, right? In Absolutely. Switzerland, for example, yeah. like everyone is so proud of being a butler, right? Yes. But yeah. not in this part of the world. Yeah. So I think that sense of pride as well needs to be instilled in the workers that we have. That's right. Yeah. So a lot of this really comes down to mindsets mm -hmm. rather than progressive wage. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. It's very important that they earn a decent salary. Mm. But a lot of it comes down to mindsets. It also comes down to uh, how society mm. appreciates and, and values every individual for the work that they do and for who they are. Mm. Uh, and, and it's for all of us to change our mindsets. Yeah. Yeah. For the families in particular, we are also trying to link them up, each family, uh, with a volunteer befriender. Mm. So that that volunteer befriender can be a supporter, can encourage them, can handhold them, right. and can 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 you know persuade them to yeah. start thinking afresh, you know, about mm. the job they do, what yeah. what are their passions, and how they can start thinking about stabilizing. I think their I lives. know what you're talking about. The job skills integrators, right? No, <laughs> no, 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 that one. Okay, no, because no, that's no, no, later no, on we're going to talk we're about. We're talking that too. about volunteer befrienders. Okay. Yeah. No, or, actually, it's yeah. the entire ecosystem. It's, we it's, must it's, have the community there to support each other, right? Absolutely. Mm. Okay, I have to move things along because we are running out of time. But Shamia, I know also as employer, mm. uh, like CPF, we talk about raising the rates. Is that a concern of yours? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Actually, before that, I wanted to remark. I think not just lift technicians, even software engineers. Oh, for sure. Oh, <gasps> you know, their, their roles are being automated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I. 
yes, you see around the world and in, in, to some extent in Singapore, some yes. of the tech giants have yeah, started yeah, yeah. to lay off right, some right. of their software engineers and programmers. But, but frankly, if you look at particularly programmers, people who can code software mm. engineers, I would say they are still in great demand. Mm, mm. The banks need more. That's right. uh, other companies need more software engineers. So yes, right. there is a little bit of a crunch, yeah. specifically in the, some of the tech giants. Mm. But in fact, the skills that we're talking about are still in high demand. Mm, agree, agree. I think it's, uh, it's probably a, you know, a short-lived uh, phenomenon. Uh, I mean, back, back to the race salary yep. ceilings. I was just really curious about as to the timing of it. Uh, because, you know, businesses, we, we're all having to cope with, uh, yes, the GST hikes, but also uh, right, uh, electricity bills are going up. Uh, there's also rent to contend with. Mm. So as much as we want to create high-quality jobs with good salaries, right, um, what the uh, CPF raises mean is essentially it adds uh, overhead to a wider segment of our workforce. So from the business point of view, cash flow now becomes uh, a bit tighter. And actually for the employees affected, their, their take-home pay is reduced as well. You know, so I was just wondering, uh, because it kind of flies against the uh, you know, home measures uh, to cope with increased cost of living, but now we are kind of reducing the, mm -hmm. the cash component here. Yeah. Well, I can understand why there is that concern for employers and to some extent for individuals. But we also need to look at the long term. Mm -hmm. Retirement adequacy is a very important issue. And if we don't start building up for our retirement, um, we are storing up more problems for ourselves and for society. And, and the, really, the CPF salary ceiling ought to be keeping pace with inflation. Mm -hmm. That's the right way to think about this. It's, it can't be that we set the salary ceiling at 6,000 mm -hmm. and forever it doesn't change. Because wages are going up, prices are going up, we ought to be also keeping pace with inflation. Um, but be precisely because we recognise that this is not a good time to do, and so we decided to, after discussions phase with the it. tripartite partners, phase it out over quite a, <laughs> four years, so four stages. Yes. So it, it's quite a, a staged process so that we can manage the impact mm. overall. Yeah, so Shamir, so you still have time to make more money to prepare for that. <laughs> I know, we need it back, you know. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs>